today for this event, uh, which is to take stock of Canada's environmental progress. I'd also like to, pardon me, I'm just going to check my mic. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for supporting our work and making it possible to hold conversations like these. Um, you probably just heard that this event is being recorded. I wanted to make sure everybody knows it will be shared with all our registrants and on YouTube after the event. Um, additionally, uh, closed captioning is available to everybody um, during the event. If you require it, you can access um, the button in the bottom right side of your screen. It's a CC button. So we're all joining today from Indigenous land across uh, what's now called Canada or so-called Canada. The land on which Greenpack is headquartered is the traditional territory of the Wendat, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to acknowledge my and Greenpack and all of our responsibility to take action towards reconciliation, to build and mend relationships, and to uplift and uphold the leadership and the stewardship and the sovereign rights of Indigenous people. If you don't know Greenpack, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit that believes that the health of our planet should be a driving force in Canadian politics. And so we work to build environmental leadership in politics across parties and together with youth um, and everyday advocates. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to turn it over to our moderator shortly. I'm going to introduce David now, but David is actually having um, uh, an issue and we'll have to step in partway through uh, the start of this event. Um, so, but I'll let you know that uh, our moderator, moderator, when he's able to make it, will be David Mackay. David is the National Observer's Deputy Managing Editor, a journalism teacher in many places. He's busy. Uh, Carleton, King's College, and Toronto Metropolitan University. And he was formerly an award-winning investigative producer and reporter with CBC. Um, and so uh, while we wait for David to join us, I'm going to inv invite our panelists to all come off, uh, sorry, on camera and to introduce themselves. Uh, and I'll, um, I'll cue you all to do that. So uh, let's start with Anayat. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am a climate journalist at CBC News, normally based in Toronto. Um, I cover national climate policy, climate solutions, and, and, and nature conservations, and also international negotiations on climate change. Um, I'm currently on leave for a year. Uh, I'm uh, attending a science journalism fellowship at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I'm working on a project related to climate journalism and also taking classes and just learning more about this field. Perfect. Uh, and now let's go to Dr. Sayers. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's morning out here in British Columbia. Um, I come to you today from the New Chalmers Territories on the west coast of Vancouver Island. I call Cloyes, Hupachasaksup Nuchanlathot. My English name is Judith Sayers. I am president of the New Chalmers Tribal Council. I'm also a chancellor at Vancouver Island University and um, do many other things, but um, climate change is something that impacts our new channel people um, quite a bit. And so that's been one area of my um, devoting time to, because we just need to make those changes. So thank you, nice to see you all. Thanks for joining. I see David has joined us. I'll just have Dr. Harrison introduce herself and then David over to you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Harrison. I'm a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, where I teach courses in and conduct research on climate policy. Um, I This is actually my second career. My first career was as a chemical engineer working in um, design of an upgrader for the oil sands a very long time ago. And so I think it's kind of an interesting bookend. I started my career um, working to develop this resource that um, we now know has to uh, be significantly reduced and very rapidly.
So do I take it from here? Yeah, sorry, David. Yes, welcome. Okay, we're, I we're glad I you made it. I didn't see, see myself there, so I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, <laughs> yep. you, you are now pinned, and we've introduced you. We're glad you're here, and we'll turn okay, it over to good. you. Okay, good, good, okay. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, this is a very um, important conversation that we're having, um, especially now that the polls are telling us that uh, one of the main concerns of people is housing, uh, despite the fact that we've had a a season of wildfires that the planet is heating up. I'm not telling anyone that any, you know, I'm not saying anything that anyone doesn't know. So this is uh, actually perfect timing for this kind of discussion. Now, the premise of this event is that for the average Canadian who is concerned about climate change and who cares about the environment, it can be hard to make sense of where we're at as a nation. Like how do policy announcements add up in terms of impact and against the changing realities on the ground? So we're going to take a look at some of the big priority areas for Canada, asking our panelists who have just introduced themselves to look at the big picture over the next, well, it will be less than an hour now. So um, I, I, I have a number of questions for the panelists, and the way we'll do it is I'll introduce, um, before I introduce each question, I'll just announce the, the, the topic that we'll be covering, okay? So that'll, that'll help us uh, group the discussion quite nicely. So we're going to start with the biodiversity targets, and I'm going to start with you, Anaya. Um, Canada has committed to protecting 25% of all Canadian lands and oceans by 2025, 30% by 2030, and also to halt and, res and, and, and reverse and reserve um, biodiversity loss as part of the UN Convention of Biological Diversity at COP15. And as we all know, that was in Montreal last December. I, I attended that. Um, it was a, a phenomenal event. Now, the government is now consulting on national strategy to achieve commitments. So, and I can you tell us, like, what does all this mean? Like, what, what are these targets? What does it mean to meet them? And is it realistic? I'm glad that we're starting with this because I feel like sometimes, you know, all the attention is on the climate crisis uh, and the atmosphere, uh, global warming. And that's not the only, you know, civilization threatening crisis that we're facing. So what these nature targets really are about, it's an acknowledgement that we are facing a crisis in nature. Um, and nature provides a lot of these so-called ecosystem services that we rely on. So obviously we rely on the atmosphere to regulate temperature, but we also rely on forests, on wetlands, on the cryosphere for various things. We rely on it for clean water, for food, for medicine medicine, uh, for flood control in cities. Um, and, and all of these systems are under a lot of stress because a lot of the land has been converted to uses for cities, for agriculture. Um, the oceans are threatened. Um, so, uh, you know, the 30% target uh, reflects the need to conserve nature. And it's really 30% is considered the kind of minimum amount of land and water that we need to protect globally. Uh, to sustain nature uh, and make sure that we can reverse uh, some of these dramatic declines that we're seeing. Um, now, it's very ambitious. So to give you a scale of what's needed in Canada, about 13 to 14% of uh, the land is currently conserved in some way. That includes all of those iconic national parks that we have established over the past over a century. And we have mm -hmm. to, so Banff, Algonquin, we have to double that uh, by 2030. So we have to double that in just seven years. So it's very ambitious, um, but Canada is trying to lead by example here um, and uh, you know try to show the world that it can be done um, and why it's essential. So yeah, big targets. Um... Do you think the targets really mean that much to the average Canadian? I mean, there's all kinds of targets and numbers, and that's one of the problems with the climate change, climate crisis debate. There's so many numbers, and yet these are more numbers that were thrown at us. Yeah, it's it's a lot, right? So it's important to remember the overall message here, which, you know, it's 30% is the target, but it's really about reversing nature decline. And it's really about establishing these new protected areas. So. Uh, you know, beyond reaching that 30%, it's about where these protected areas are going to be, um, how we are going to benefit from them, 
and very importantly, how they're going to be run. It's going to be different from how we did it over the past century. It needs to be. It's going to be science focused. It's going to incorporate the rights of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it's important to look beyond the targets um, uh, for more reasons than just, you know, they can go a bit over our heads. Mm -hmm. And your mention of indigenous peoples allows me to pivot beautifully to uh, Judith. Um, so here we're going to be talking about indigenous leadership. Um, you know, with both biodiversity and climate change, Canada says indigenous leadership is key to meeting our goals and, and it sees indigenous involvement as a way to advance reconciliation. I remember, um, you know, one of the opening speeches, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Pierre, uh, um, Justin Trudeau, uh, gave the opening speech and he made a big deal of it. And actually, this was one of the first announcements that he that 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 he made. So, Judith, in your view, is Canada making serious strides here? And 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 at what pace? Okay. I think Canada is making some strides, but certainly not enough. Um, the recognition uh, may be there that there has to be incorporation and working with leadership of First Nations, but the actual actions hasn't happened. So for instance, um, the Emergency Act and the Fisheries Act includes incorporation of Indigenous knowledge. It doesn't equate it with science, which it should, and it doesn't, um, you know, and it, so it's applied differently across Canada, um, depending on Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And so, you know, that's, you know, that's a real issue. Um, we were just talking about biodiversity. They've been trying to establish a marine protected area, off the, a large one off the west coast of Vancouver Island, which includes Haida, Pachidot, Quetzino. And it took us five years to negotiate a memorandum of understanding because they didn't want to include co-management and use of our Indigenous knowledge. So that kind of shows you the political unwillingness, unfortunately, because, you know, these oceans need to be protected and they still allow... Um, deep sea mining in these marine protected areas. So there has to be some real changes in relation to um, the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So, you know, there's movement, but there just still isn't enough movement as we, you know, on the front lines, as First Nations are facing um, climate emergencies everywhere in our backyards. So if you had to draw up a blueprint, say over the next year, what would that look like? to make the kind of progress that you'd like to see? I think Canada has to sit down seriously with each of the First Nations uh, and figure out how we can work together. How is that the use of our knowledge going to help in climate, in management? And we just don't see that. It's just kind of sporadic as the need arise or as they want to, you know, create a protected area. Um, so, you know, we just can't wait. Like the Emergency Act absolutely does not even include Indigenous people. And so when emergencies happen, we don't even have to be notified. So there've got to be some real changes in legislation. But I think even just in practicality, sitting down, negotiating memorandums of understanding, how are we going to do this? How are we going to protect Indigenous knowledge? Um, and, and so there just needs to be some very serious conversations and a recognition of what we bring to the table as Indigenous people and how we're going to help in this whole glo global crisis. That, maybe it shouldn't, but that answer surprises me because I would have assumed that that's happening already, that that no. kind of consultation. No. There you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, some, in some places here and there, but no, it, it just isn't, and it's really unfortunate. Hmm, okay. Well, uh, hopefully we can circle back to that and, and maybe with some of the questions as well, because uh, that's an important topic. But I want to move on to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, Catherine. Um, I'll, uh, or Kathy, I'll be asking you about this. So Canada has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 45 percent below 20, below 2005 by 2023, by 2030. See all those numbers. See what I mean? And I had all those numbers, right? Lots of numbers here. But the latest data from the national inventory showed that emissions went up 1.8 percent from 2020 to 2021. So basically emissions are going up. We're we're polluting more. So how do we interpret these numbers? I know there are a lot there, but how do we interpret the numbers? And can new policy levers that have been taken, that have taken effect and that have been announced, can they work? Oh, just unmute yourself. There you go. 
the number of times a day someone has to remind <laughs> me of that. Um, the most the most obvious takeaway from those numbers is that we have a long way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, our emissions are a few percent below that 2005 baseline, but from where we were in 2021, the most recent inventory, we still need a one third reduction by 2030. Um, I think there's some good news in there, um, in the reductions we've seen so far. And also in 2008, in the global financial crisis, we bounced back right away to where we were, were before. And in that increase from 2020, when there was a sharp reduction during the pandemic to the 1.8, I think, percent, you said, increase Mm -hmm. to 2021, we didn't fully bounce back. Um, And I think what we're seeing there is these policies are starting to work. I think the reductions we've seen are especially from phase out of coal-fired electricity generation. I think we're probably starting to see emissions reductions from the first round of methane regulations. But we know we need so much more. So we've got an emissions reduction plan, a nationwide one that was released in 2022. And we need every single measure in that plan to be adopted without relaxation, without delay, to even get within spitting distance of the lower bound, the 40% reduction target. Um, Those are things we can do and they can be done, but we have never had this scale of policy ambition before. And the last really quick point I'll I'll end with, with all these numbers, and it's easy to become cynical, we've missed all our deadlines before, um, is that, well, it's just not going to work. But it is so much better to get a 38% reduction by 2030 than a 0% reduction. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the lesson is we need to do more, not that we need to give up. Yeah. During your answer, Kathy, I, I wrote down two numbers, one third by 2020 but by 2030 it, is that that's awfully ambitious is is that doable um it's going to be a huge challenge uh and i think i actually think um there's two important questions is the plan credible and so is it doable that's a, that's a worthwhile question mm-hmm. but i think we tend to focus too much on that and not enough on let's start doing it Let's do the stuff in that plan and get past um, debating if we'll meet the target or not. Because if we spend all our time debating that, we're not going to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're not going to meet that target. Yeah. So I guess I, I guess just to just to end this section, we have to start thinking about the things that we can do as well, right? I mean, there is the big picture, but there are the little things. Um, you know, maybe drive a, an electric vehicle if you can. A, if you can if you can afford one and and if you can get one um reducing your carbon footprint so is that part of it is is that part of the discussion as well in in reaching that target yes and no i think it is um i think we've often put too much emphasis on individual action rather mm. than policies that can create systemic action mm. you know the average canadian can't do anything about where the electricity comes from when they plug a device into the wall I I think it's important for folks who are in a position to do so to demonstrate what can be done. So I've installed a heat pump in my home. I use an electric bike. Um, My emissions reductions are pretty small, but I do so to try underscore. My life is perfectly good with with these changes. But ultimately, we need public policies that make sure those changes are happening for everyone. All the vehicles that are being sold are zero emissions. All the electricity coming out of the wall is zero emissions. Okay, so when we talk about oil and gas emissions, which is which is our next section, that's huge for public policy. Now, to achieve climate stability, we need to decarbonize our energy supply and address emissions from oil and gas, which is responsible for thirty percent. There's another number: thirty percent of our GHG emission emissions as a sector. Now, given some of the decisions that we've seen from Canada in recent years, some may be feeling a tad confused about where we're going in terms of limiting and reducing oil and gas emissions. So Anaya, the government is committed to introducing an oil and gas sector cap by the end of the year. We'll see if it meets that deadline. What's expected from this new policy tool and how much does it need to, does it need to do within the um, Canada's policy toolkit? 
So what can we expect? Yeah, um, so a lot of the details uh, on, on how the cap will be designed uh, exactly, you know, what kind of cap it will be um, and what the cap will be actually um, are, are yet to be released. So, so that's, you know, once that comes out, we'll be able to analyze that. But the cap is really an essential part of, of Canada's uh, emissions reductions plan. So, you know, as you have pointed out, um, emissions have overall continued to grow, uh, but especially from the oil and gas sector, um, emissions have continued to grow and it is going to be the largest part of Canada's emissions uh, by 2030. So bringing that under control is, is really essential and a cap um, is, is really important. But I think it's important to remember what these emissions are. So most of Canada's oil and gas is exported. Um, and when it's exported and burned in other countries, uh, in cars and power plants, that's counted towards the emissions of those countries. So what we are counting here in Canada is emissions from the production of oil and gas, um, all of the oil and gas that's burned during the production or that leaks into the atmosphere. So this cap is not a cap on the production of Canadian oil and gas. It's just a cap on the emissions. And what the government is trying to do here is design it in such a way that it forces companies to, to be more innovative um, and to be able to produce more oil and gas, but uh, while staying within that cap. So it forces them essentially to invest more money on um, quote unquote cleaner ways of producing these fossil fuels. Now, you've written uh, about how changes in global demand for Canadian oil and gas might impact Canada's continued production. Can you tell us about how market conditions might play a role in oil and gas phase out and the transition to a clean economy? Yeah, that's that's a real uh, you know major question mark, because um, every time we, we model, uh, for example, an oil and gas cap and how it might impact oil and gas emissions and production, uh, we have to make assumptions about what global oil prices will be. Because as I said before, most of the oil and gas is exported. So really what drives Canadian oil and gas production is global demand and global prices uh, more than any domestic policy can. And in fact, the Canada Energy Regulator, um, for the first time this year, did modeling uh, on how oil and gas production in Canada will, will proceed uh, in a world where all of the countries of the world, uh, uh, you know, ramp up their climate ambitions and move towards net zero by 2050. And it found essentially that if the rest of the world does up its ambition and goes on the right track, uh, Canadian oil and gas uh, production will peak by around 2026, so just three years from now. Mm -hmm. And it really shows how production and also, uh, you know, in that sense, emissions in this country um, really depend on what's happening abroad. Now, there was another piece of that question, which is the the transition to a clean economy. We know in Alberta, Premier Dan Daniel Smith has put a moratorium on, on, on clean energy until the beginning of the new year. Uh, there's been a significant pushback. Um, there are questions about how quickly we can we can, you know, we can pivot to clean energy. So, does the do you think that the cap will, whenever it's announced, will speed up that transition? That's the design of it. So it's it's really again to force companies to invest in in cleaner technologies. Um, either cleaner technologies to produce fossil fuels in a more efficient manner or to switch to cleaner sources of energy like hydro or solar or wind. Um, and, and really, this is an acknowledgement that, again, if global forces uh, move the world towards uh, cleaner energy sources, then Canada risks being left behind. Uh, if we don't transition at the same rate, um, there won't be a market for our fossil fuels and uh, we won't be in this the new future economy. So the cap, all of these market driven measures are really a way to transition Canada as a whole to, you know, align closer to what's happening in other parts of the world. You know, it's really interesting that we're having this conversation at the same time that uh, uh, Suncor CEO Rich Kruger has recent, recently announced that, well, the company, maybe it's not going to invest so robustly in in, in clean tech. And now uh, Charlie Ang and the, the NDP's Charlie Angus wants to bring him before a parliamentary committee to basically explain himself. So uh, this is happening at a very interesting time. Um, I want to pivot to you, um, Catherine, and, and talk about um, uh, wildfires policy and policy adaptiveness. Now, 
what do the wildfires uh, that have been burning across the country uh, at at a torrid pace. What what does this what does this do to the whole debate over our climate plan? Remains to be seen. Um, <laughs> a horrible summer, and um, my heart goes out to all those who lost their homes, to the families of firefighters who lost their lives, people who were displaced for weeks from their communities. Um, And people are dying in very large numbers in other places in the world. Um, In 2001, British Columbia had two huge events. Um, There was a heat dome that killed 600 people. These are my neighbors in the city of Vancouver. And people died waiting for ambulances that never came. And then we had this mass flooding in the Fraser Valley. And I thought, that's it. This is the moment. Everyone's going to get serious about climate change. So I I don't assume that this horrible, horrible summer is that moment because I'm honestly pretty fearful that for a lot of people, they've gone from um, denying anything was going on to, oh, well, bad things happen. This is just the world. Um, But of course, this isn't the new normal. It's going to keep getting worse. And sooner or later, everyone's going to be impacted themselves or know someone who is. So let's assume this is the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing is a big tension in Canadians' priorities from pocketbook issues, cost of living, housing, and climate. And we are seeing the main national political parties take a different um, strategy on that. The under... um, Mr. Poilievre, the Conservatives are putting all their chips on pocketbook issues, Um, not just that that's their main emphasis, housing, 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 cost of living, but calling for rolling back quite effective climate policies like the carbon tax, like a clean fuel standard. So they're all in. And I think since the Conservative Convention last week, we are seeing the Liberals really coming out swinging on their climate policy, trying to emphasize the policies that they've already adopted, the plan that is on the table, and challenge the credibility of um, the Conservatives. So I think the next election, whenever that comes federally, is likely to be a real test of Canadians' priorities and also the kinds of accountability mechanisms that might be useful in holding all parties to account. You know, I mean, I try not to look at polls, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to ignore them when they're when they're covered so heavily. And one of the things that seems to happen with 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 polls, and you probably know this better than me, is that climate change never really maintains the number one position for very long. It always seems to be knocked out by something else more immediate. And I'm wondering whether or not you think that maybe that's the conservatives political calculation is that while pocketbook issues that's going to be the bottom line. If you can't afford a house, you're not necessarily going to worry about what might or might not happen by 2030, you know? I mean, it is true. We've had three previous peaks in public attention to environment in Canada, late 60s, late 80s, um, sort of 2008. And each time when the economy took a turn for the worse, public attention declined. Something interesting started to happen in 2015, though, where we started seeing environment or climate and the economy both being top issues instead of substitutes. So that's going to be an interesting one, I think, going forward. I do think that the from everything we're seeing, the conservative strategy is to emphasize the here and now, immediate cost of living issues, housing is a top of mind concern. Um, but I don't think they've been challenged much yet on have they got anything remotely credible um, on climate because Canadians do care about that as well and they'll need to get votes from some of those folks Um, and uh, so far they haven't said anything remotely credible. Yeah well another pocketbook issue and this allows me to um, uh, go to my next topic is 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 jobs basically and when we talk about climate we talk about transitioning to 
you know, cleaner jobs in a cleaner sector. And and Judith, I'm wondering from you, you know, what, what I find really interesting is when we talk about indigenous communities, you know, there, there there's talk of uh, of getting buy-in from certain communities to, you know, be be part of uh, TMX, to be, you know, buy into pipelines, to buy into the traditional fossil fuels. But there's also talk about transitioning to the clean economy. Which of those two is gaining more traction, do you think? I definitely think changing to cleaner technologies is more in line with Indigenous values and something that we seek after. And it's certainly been an important topic um, in Indigenous communities, especially as we're trying to transition off of fossil fuels. You know, the, the federal government <clears throat> has put money into clean energy, uh, and certainly not enough. Uh, we need to transition our diesel-dependent communities mm -hmm. off of diesel. And um, they put pots of money, but not enough to do the whole transition. And I, I think if we're serious about this, we need to put that money in. And British Columbia, for instance, there's 44 diesel-dependent communities. And, you know, in this day and age, um, with the environmental impacts, that's mm -hmm. just crazy. And it should have been done a long time ago. But every province, as you mentioned, Danielle Smith, um, is different in what they want to do in clean energy. There hasn't been a call for power in British Columbia in 15 years. They're finally doing one um, with the new premier here. And, you know, it's just a necessity for First Nations to be part of this industry, to be shaping the energy future of this country and be part of setting that national energy policy um, in clean energy, clean technology, clean jobs. Because once you put in place all of these renewable projects in various communities, you do create income, you do create the jobs that you don't have with, you know, large dams here and there. And 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 so this is a, a huge area for First Nations. And in British Columbia, we've been pushing this a lot of years because there hasn't been the call for power and there hasn't been an inclusion in the past 15 years of First Nations and clean energy. Yeah, I mean, th that's a lot of communities that are dependent on diesel, and 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 you can magnify that across the country. We've we've written a lot about that at, at Canada's mm -hmm. National Observer. So I'm wondering, uh, in, in terms of a policy, what would you like to see happen again, say within the next, like, we, we have to move on this, right? So within the next year, what would you like to see happen? Well, Canada has committed to um, catching up on First Nations infrastructure by 2030. To me, infrastructure includes clean energy. And I, I think, um, you know, at one point Trudeau said he was going to, you know, get everybody off of diesel. You know, and, and here we are all these years later and we haven't. So there has Just to like be... the Boy Water Advisories. Exactly. That, that promise. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There has to be a strategy of how we're going to do this. And, you know, it has to be a step by step strategy with money invested, with a community buy in. And so there has to be a concrete plan, which there hasn't been to date. It's just, hey, apply to this pot of money, you know, then get it off of it. And, you know, so I really think that we just need more serious consideration and uh, implementation of getting people off of diesel. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about electricity, federalism and electricity. Um, on August the 10th, Canada introduced a draft clean electricity regulation, which is intended to make our national grid net zero by 2035. There's another one of those numbers. Catherine, so this is a question for you. Um, can you tell us about the relative importance of this tool in the clean energy transition and how does it fit into the clean energy transition? Um, they're all important. Like we, we cannot, <laughs> um, we can't meet our 2030 target, let alone net zero. We have to like be accelerating when we hit 2030 right. without every single one of these things. So I think the clean electricity um regulation, the proposed regulation is important in two ways. Uh, the first is that electricity generation accounts for about 8% of Canada's emissions. That's smaller than transportation and oil and gas production, but it's, it's a significant chunk. And it's also um, a relatively easy one, what, you know, economists call low hanging fruit. We have cheaper ways to reduce that, those emissions than many other things. So this needs to happen. That regulation doesn't actually get us to net zero in 2035 because they built in some um, uh, concessions for new gas plants that allows mm -hmm. them to, would allow them to operate for, I think, 20 years um, 
without uh, carbon capture. So I think that's a problem that could be tightened, but still it's going in the right direction. It's hugely important. And this is a you know comparative advantage for Canada. The second part, and this is why clean electricity is so vital, is that the way we reduce a lot of those other emissions from transportation, from industry, is to electrify, electrify how we heat our buildings, electrify how we move around, electrify a lot of the energy um, for manufacturing in this country. And um, a study by the Canadian Climate Institute that came out last year anticipated that across Canada, we're going to need two to three times greater electricity generation capacity. So we need not only to clean up our electricity, but to build a whole lot more of it. So that the flip side of that proposed clean electricity regulation is a commitment in the federal budget to um, about $25 billion to share the costs of expanding um, generation and building transmission lines that cross provincial borders. Now in our federal system, provinces and territories, as you well know, are responsible for energy policy decarbonizing the grid will be a lot harder for some provinces and territories than others. So how do you move past barriers to buy-in? Um, so I do want to, I want to challenge the, the statement that provinces are responsible for energy okay. policy. Please do, please um, do. They are, they are responsible for building electricity generation and approving it and regulating the price of electricity. But there are other aspects of electricity and other forms of energy that the federal government has a legitimate role to play. Um, the federal government is responsible for regulating um, interprovincial transmission lines. Um, the one case we have on the... Um, federal regulation of coal upheld federal authority to regulate emissions from mm -hmm. electricity generation. I imagine that will be tested again when that clean electricity regulation is um, finalized. Uh, but the, the premise that this is a tough one for federal provincial relations is absolutely true because the, the places, Canada has pretty clean electricity on balance, but the provinces that don't have um, clean electricity are the ones that also happen to have fossil fuels, Nova mm -hmm. Scotia with coal, but especially Alberta and Saskatchewan. And those are the provinces that are also fighting other climate policies, especially a proposed oil and gas cap, the clean fuel standard. Um, so we are seeing, you know, Premier Danielle Smith of Alberta, you know, um, fight this one as well as all the others. Um, and this question of how do we move, how do we get buy-in? I don't think we do. I think it, you know, Alberta accounts for 38% of Canada's emissions. There is no indication that the Alberta government is on board with serious action on climate change. And so we face a choice between everybody getting along, which Canadians love, and meeting our climate targets. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have faced that choice for decades and for decades, Canadian federal governments allowed Alberta to veto proposed national policies mm -hmm. that changed in 2016. And I, I think there's an argument that they have to be willing to take this fight on um, because something more important is at stake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Adaptation. Um, one climate strategy has uh, that has received federal and provincial support with relative ease <laughs> has been uh, the Climate Adapt Adaption Action Plan. Um, Anaya, what can you tell us about Canada's plans to get us ready to live with the impact of climate change in terms of ambition and spending? And it's I, I also find it really interesting how the buy-in for this plan has been so different, <laughs> uh, you know, from from all of these other contentious issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the provinces and territories are on board, and it it just it reflects the need for for this. It, you know, all the provinces know that they will have to spend money on adaptation because they're all facing uh, those climate crises: heat, wildfires, flooding. Um, there's no part of the country that's untouched, and so. Uh, you know, this adaptation strategy was long awaited. Uh, the government, the federal government has released it and it includes money. 
uh, about $2 billion. Uh, but the government has acknowledged that that's more of a down payment. Uh, a lot more money will have to come from government, but also be mobilized through public-private partnerships or other sources um, to help communities adapt. Uh, but money is an important part of this plan. Uh, but even more importantly, the plan does include a lot of targets, interim targets, uh, to kind of guide Canada's part towards adapting to the climate crisis. So uh, this includes everything from targets on, uh, uh, you know, eliminating deaths from heat waves, for example, or establishing 15 new national urban parks um, uh, to, uh, you know, targets to get Canada's health systems um, adapted to climate change, Canada's mental health care for uh, people suffering from climate-related disasters, uh, awareness amongst the public, uh, but also local governments uh, and, and the private sector on the need for climate-friendly investments and, and infrastructure, updating Canada's building codes. So basically, you know, every part of, of society that needs to adapt to climate change and change itself, um, there are targets for that. Uh, what the strategy is less clear on is, uh, you know, the specific projects um, uh, that will get us there. Uh, but that's why the buy-in from the provinces is so important, because a lot of those specific projects will be led at the local level. Hmm. Now, uh, we're nearing the end of our, our, our session, unfortunately. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'd like people to think about questions that they can put in the chat. Um, but to kick things off, I want to I want to do a panelist round here and I want to talk I want to circle back to politics and I'd like each one of you to kind of weigh in with your thoughts about how you think the political discussion is going to take place they the MPs uh re return back to work next week um there'll be a lot of talk about housing et cetera et cetera but we, how do you anticipate that the climate change part of it will figure into the political discussion Catherine, I'll start with you. I mean, the the cabinet ministers calling out um, the Conservatives on climate in the last week or two is a signal of where they're thinking, and that's that this is a this is they seem to think, and I think for good reason that this is a winning issue for them. Um, I expect we they will emphasize the measures in their plan, but also especially um, be critical of the Conservatives absence of a plan, putting uh, trying to put mm. the Conservatives on the spot saying, what are you going to do? How are you going to meet those targets? Um, and, you know, that's been an effective strategy in the 2019 and 2021 election. Mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. Liberals. And I I think, um, you know, when I, when I think about that, I think about like the generational divide here. Um, uh, you know, people in my generation, younger, are, are very concerned about climate change. It is a top issue, um, along with all those other issues, but but we know that this is going to affect us in the future. So what I'm looking for is whether that can be mobilized into uh, action at the polling stations, um, mm -hmm. because we, we know from the polling that, that, you know, for some generations, this is a top issue. Um, and the other thing I'm waiting to see is, um, uh, you know, what, where this lands for those kind of battleground um, ridings in, in the greater Toronto area and the lower mainland of BC uh, that have a lot of people of color, a lot of immigrants. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, th that's where the next federal election is going to be decided in large part. Um, and, um, and, the environment is going to compete with a lot of other priorities there. Yeah. Judith. Well, I think <clears throat> most Canadians want to talk about climate. They want to talk about why there aren't enough resources to be battling flooding and forest fires. They want <clears throat> to be talking about how do we put together the highways that have been lost, um, the biodiversity I, there's critical things that face us every day um, that we can't always rely on the federal buy, bailout um, for all of these people who've lost their homes. Yeah, I think people are asking critical questions, and I, I think the politicians are going to have to start addressing that. 
how do we plan for the future? It's got to be planned soon uh, because we have so many, um, sorry, uh, we have so many um, issues right now. So yeah. I, I think the politicians are going to have to be honest and they're they going to have to be real and just deal with um, all of these issues that are facing Canadians. And we need that kind of communication because I don't think there was many of us that were, were not impacted by forest fires or flooding um, and all of these things that are going on in Canada. Yeah. I mean, right now, as we've, as we've said, it, 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 housing seems to be the big, you know, the big topic. Uh, and, and it's almost like housing versus climate change. Is, is there a way to address both? Like, why does it have to be one or the other? Uh, what, what, what do you think, Catherine? Is there a way or does it have to be one or the other? Well, certainly as we're increasing the amount of housing stock as a way to increase access and hopefully reduce prices, we need to make sure that um, ideally those should be net zero buildings now. We have the technology to do these things. I think we should be banning new gas hookups in all but the most remote places where um, people don't have electricity access. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be designing our, our, our housing policies with the urgency of reducing Canada's emissions in mind. Mm -hmm. Judith, what do you think? Yeah, I think we need a holistic approach. <laughs> hmm. I don't think you can leave one out without the other. Sorry, mm -hmm. my, my grandson wants to get in on this. Um, <laughs> there he the is. future. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think that conversation has got to be a part of it. Like how every part of our sector of society has a role to play in climate change and reducing greenhouse gases. And I think housing is a large part of that as well. Mm -hmm. And Anayat, uh, you're you're a journalist. You know how this works. You know, you are sitting around in a story meeting and housing is the big issue of the day, pretty hard for you to pitch a climate change story, right? So how do you how do you balance these two? Does it have to be one or the other? Or is it, I don't know, what do you think? I think uh, that's the challenge of framing for us as journalists and also political leaders, because mm -hmm. it's not an either or. Um, the path to fixing all of these other problems we have, like housing, um, like jobs uh, go through climate change. Um, you know, it's become increasingly clear, for example, in places like Toronto, uh, the the way to fix the housing crisis is to build denser communities. Um, and that in itself is a climate solution because we can't keep sprawling out into mm -hmm vital ecosystems and farmland. Um, it's the same for jobs. You know, the transition to a cleaner economy uh, will lead to more stable green jobs as well. Um, adaptation investment uh, is also, again, about the economy, about reducing losses, uh, about uh, uh, protecting housing. So um, I think it's about framing uh, for us, for leaders, uh, to show that all of these other problems that we face are related to climate change, and we can solve both of them simultaneously. It's not a question of uh, postponing one issue for another. Okay, so we, uh, I, I will continue with uh, some of the questions here that we've been getting from our audience. And one has to do with a, a sector that we haven't talked about, and that's agriculture. So how do we get political and polit politically ambitious leadership on reducing emissions in sectors like Agriculture. Uh, who wants? Who wants to? Who wants to take a crack at that? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, Catherine, you're on. And I'm muted. Okay, um, agriculture is a tricky one because farmers can be very conservative, and um, so on one hand, they, you know. My mom lives in southwestern Ontario, and there were anti-carbon tax signs all over the farmland there. So perhaps as with zero emission vehicles, we need government programs to support um, farmers in moving to lower carbon equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but the other challenging one is a lot of the emissions from agriculture are release of methane from the soil. That's not covered by the carbon tax. That's a tricky thing 
um, to regulate. And there, I think it's going to be supporting farmers, but also not giving them bogus offsets that they can sell to the oil and gas industry, in which case we could end up with the pretense of um, reducing both sectors and not actually making much progress in either one of them. And just very quickly, tell us what an offset is. An offset, there's different kinds of offsets. There's mm -hmm. voluntary ones where you can offset your flight mm -hmm. by investing in something. The ones I'm talking about are ones where an actor that faces a regulatory obligation to reduce their emissions is given an option to pay someone else who isn't regulated to reduce their emissions. Often that takes the form of, um, has taken the form of paying farmers to change their agricultural practices or um, paying someone not to cut down trees. And the problem is we're trying to predict what would have happened in those other sectors. If our predictions are wrong, we are actually giving someone credit for something that isn't real and our emissions will be higher than they mm -hmm. would have been. Mm -hmm. I would also add that I think food sovereignty is really critical in many places in Canada. Mm -hmm. We bring in so many produce and products from other countries. And if we can cut down those kind of greenhouse gases by actually having our own um, food uh, as much as possible, then I think that also would help. Here's a question I absolutely love. It's from a, it's from a young person. Um, amidst this moment of climate concern and and, and doomism, doom, doomism, can panelists can the panelists provide examples of positive environmental achievements uh, that offer hope and inspiration for a more sustainable future? Can you think of examples that kind of give us hope, make us think that we we can beat this thing? Anaya. Um, I'll go because, uh, you know, we were, we started off this discussion talking about biodiversity and, um, I was at that summit as were you, David, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in Montreal last year where this historic agreement was struck. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible. These agreements involve like 180, 190 countries who have to all agree on the same thing. Um, and uh, and that thing being a very ambitious target that's going to cost them all a lot of money to to protect um, land and water. And, um, you know, those negotiations were difficult. They dragged on through the night on the last day, um, involved a lot of work, um, a lot of, uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears. Uh, but it, it got done. And it really brought me up close and personal with people who still believe these kind of ambitious agreements can be done in this day and age, um, despite all of the, uh, you know, quote unquote, doomism. So, uh, you know, every time I think about, oh my God, the world's just ending, I remember that there is, you know, millions of people working on this problem, um, mm -hmm. passionate people, smart people, um, and if they haven't given up, then, you know, neither should we. Now, I think all the panelists should take a crack at this one, because this is an important question and a nice way to end, right? To, to give people some hope. Catherine. Um, I think we're seeing huge progress in technology and some progress in policy. Um, I'm particularly enthusiastic about the, the transition we're seeing in the motor vehicle industry. Um, Climate action is an existential threat to the oil and gas industry, but it's not to the auto industry or others that historically have used fossil fuels because they can produce stoves that rely on electricity. They can produce vehicles that rely on electricity or biofuels. We can heat our homes, not with gas furnaces, but with heat pumps that are very efficient. So the the rate of um, emergence and the cost going down of those technologies, the cost going down of clean electricity, and the fact that we are starting in Canada to have the kinds of policies, that the framework of policies we need. We just need to turn the knobs and increase the ambition. We know what to do. Mm -hmm. Judith. Well, I'll go back to one of my favorite subjects, and of course, that's clean energy. And we've seen a lot of First Nations, even though there's no economic opportunity, but using clean energy in their communities um, to get off diesel, 
um, one community, New Channel community in particular, did a run of the river and solar, and they're not shipping diesel over the ocean any longer. Um, northern communities getting into solar, you know, even the Queen Charlottes in northern uh, northern BC, uh, because their energy bills are more than their mortgage payments, and people pay um, their energy as opposed to their mortgages. <laughs> um, so you you see, and and you see it as a movement um, with young people as well. People taking pride in their ability to reduce their consumption of electricity, but also to make clean energy, you know, for their own communities. Um, the number of heat pumps that are going into First Nations homes is amazing. Um, so, you know, we're doing what we can in our communities to change things, even though there may not be an economic opportunity, but there certainly is health and other issues that um, people are taking seriously. And what about all of you? Like, do you have hope? Do you personally... You know, people who observe, who think about this, who write about it. Do you are you hopeful, Judith? Well, I am. I, I think we're always instilled with hope mm -hmm. uh, that people will change and that there will be um, the leadership that we need. And and we certainly continue to be the voice out there saying, you know, <laughs> we have to do it now. Um, but always, there's always hope, and there's always ways to change people's thinking and i'm i'm committed to doing that myself catherine i get this question a lot <laughs> <laughs> i have determination i have you know i think people often interpret hope as do you think you know tell me everything's going to be okay and i think what we need is guts we need determination we need commitment because it's up to us to make mm -hmm. it better. Some of us are fortunate to have jobs where we can work on this all the time, but everybody has an opportunity to vote um, and to make small changes in their lives. So I, I think we need, I think we need guts rather than hope. And I, I think it's uh, impossible for me not to have hope uh, just given, you know, all the people I get to speak to who are working in this space, um, just like the incredible leaders, policymakers, um, people working in tech, um, you know, um, like Catherine pointed out, there's been such huge advances in technology and uh, almost every industry has a path to move to a cleaner future. Uh, so it's impossible not to have hope when, you know, people who work in this field know the solutions are there and the policies are available. It's just a question of uh, moving us all towards that. Yeah, and I've also been given license here to weigh in on this question myself, which I will, um, as someone who now is the deputy managing editor for, with Canada's National Observer, spends every waking hour thinking about this, more so than I did when I was at the CBC and a former colleague of Anayat. Um, I think, you know, what gives me hope is that we do a lot of stories about young people taking special initiatives in all kinds of endeavors. And they are, they are um, in colleges and universities. They're in high school. We've had high schoolers, um, you know, write op-eds. Um, we, you know, we're back in school now. We see campuses across, across the country where they are demanding that their administrations get off fossil fuels, that they sh shift their investments. And these are demands that are coming from a, 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 a base of knowledge. They're making those demands on banks. These are the future consumers, future home buyers, right, who are making demands on their institutions. And I think that you know, having spent a lifetime covering politics, one of the things that I've noticed is that the politics usually follows public opinion. You know, they usually have to be dragged kicking and screaming. So whether it's a Danielle Smith or a Doug Ford or whatever the case may be, if people have decided that, yes, I want to buy an electric vehicle, I want enough charging stations, I want to be able to breathe clean air, uh, they're going to make demands. And I think, and and maybe it's uh, being a little bit of a Pollyanna, but I think that the, you know, the politicians and the business leaders, these Suncor CEOs of the world, are going to have to catch up because investors are going to start investing, are, are going to start, you know, uh, sending a very clear message with their money and their investments. So that gives me hope. Um, 
and and I I I have hope in people. You know, I think people want to do the right thing. They say, what do, what do they say? The strongest, one of the strongest wills we have is to survive. I think those survival instincts will kick in. So here's hoping, folks. Um, well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. And um, I hope all of you out there have uh, have enjoyed that. We have. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, as we wrap, I just wanted to take a second to thank all, all of our panelists for that really interesting conversation. And to David, um, I know you had some trouble uh, at the start. <laughs> Thanks for dropping in. Right I into literally the did flow. drop in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Um, and, we're, and we're really glad uh, to, to all of you in the audience also for showing up. So thank you to everybody, to our sponsors, um, and to my colleague who ran tech in the background, Prami. And um, we have dropped a survey link also in to the chat. We'd love to hold more, more conversations on this same theme uh, or related, and we'd like to know what you'd like to hear from us and how you thought this event went. Um, so thanks to everybody for showing up and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>